Today's conversation is with Ken Kruger, the founder and CEO of Moon Technologies, or Moon. Uh, Moon is allowing people to pay with cryptocurrency anywhere privately, securely, without fees. So they have established or set up a partnership with Visa, and they issue debit cards so that people can use these debit cards and fund them through Bitcoin. So we talked about the Lightning Network, how Moon is using the Lightning Network to validate the transactions almost instantly, and then crediting those debit cards so you can use those cards anywhere that Visa is accepted, which is virtually anywhere. We talked about the regulations around uh, Visa and MasterCard, what these companies are doing. They have a crypto teams. How can set up a partnership with Visa? which is an interesting story and where they hope to go in the future. Uh, Ken is a really dynamic thinker. We covered a lot of ground in this conversation and I very much enjoyed the conversation. Uh, if you like this show, if you enjoy these interviews, please do give us a thumbs up on YouTube or a share on Twitter. It's greatly appreciated. If you have any guest suggestions, please reach out to us as well. Here is Ken Kruger. All right, Ken, we are live and I'm excited to chat with you. You are the founder of the Moon, not the Moon, <laughs> Moon, Moon Technologies, uh, which as I understand it, the, the mission really is about allowing merchants to accept money, allow people to pay using Bitcoin. So it seems like that's the, the first use case, unlocking uh, people's ability to pay with Bitcoin, not necessarily or not needing any integration on the merchant side. So mm -hmm. Amazon and other merchants, I'm sure you have a bunch of other merchants are, are some of which you can accept. Um, I'm sure that was kind of a sloppy description in your own words. <laughs> why did you start it? What, what did you view as the, like the big problem to solve here and, and where are you guys today? I know you guys have raised some money, but maybe mm -hmm. talk about just traction so far. Yeah, absolutely. So you know, I started moon, uh, back in actually 2018. So it's been a while, uh, with the idea of really making it so you can live entirely on Bitcoin, really. That, that's, that's really the vision. And I always thought that would be the case. And back in 2018, when I was thinking about this, like no one's building the uh, uh, solutions that are really going to allow that to happen, right? Merchants are not accepting Bitcoin. It, it maybe was like 1% of, of the market and really not the major merchants that you'd be shopping at. So I was thinking there must be some way to do this. So after years of trying to try to make this thing happen, we ended up being able to uh, work with Visa, where we can now allow people to pay with Bitcoin anywhere Visa is accepted. And uh, the merchant doesn't know one thing or the other, um, but we just do it in a very seamless way. And we want to do it in a way that really upholds the values of the Bitcoin community, uh, primarily around privacy, security. And, uh, and we don't charge fees. I wouldn't say that's necessarily specific to the Bitcoin community because nobody likes to pay fees, right? So, so that's the whole idea is like, how do we get to living on a Bitcoin standard? And uh, the way I kind of modeled it out was like a marketplace, right? Like any marketplace you have with, with uh, payments, you have people who are going to spend the Bitcoin, you have people who are going to receive the Bitcoin. And like any marketplace, you have to bootstrap it. So you kind of bootstrap one side and you say, okay, well, the consumers are going to pay with Bitcoin. There's a lot of demand for that. The merchants are just going to get dollars and they're not going to know the wiser. So, so that, that was kind of the whole thing. And eventually, as that consumer demand increases and there's a critical mass of people paying with Bitcoin, all of a sudden merchants are going to say, wow, wait a second, we could save a, just like a boatload of money by accepting Bitcoin directly instead of going through these payment, uh, payment processors where they're paying, you know, sometimes upwards to uh, three to 5%, depending on the merchant type. So, um, so that was kind of the, the whole thought process behind it. So where is it today? Is that latter vision implemented today where merchants are accepting Bitcoin directly or what percentage of them are? So, yeah, yeah. So for us right now, we are just focused on allowing people to pay with crypto. So what consumers do on our platform, they go and we, we allow them to create virtual Visa cards that they can load with Bitcoin and shop pretty much anywhere Visa is accepted. Um, the... Uh, you know, the whole angle of getting merchants to accept it, I still think that's far off in the future, right? Like it's going to happen eventually, mm -hmm. but I think it's just a little too far off in the future. There are still issues with it. Uh, we try to solve a lot of those problems right now with Lightning Network. We're, we're one of the earliest companies working on Lightning, one, one of the biggest uh, uh, Lightning Network projects out there. 
And you know, eventually merchants will accept these lightning payments directly. It'll automatically convert to the fiat currency. But then there's just so many problems on the merchant side, right? You accept Bitcoin, you're still going to convert it to dollars because you have to pay your suppliers, right? So the real question is for long-term Bitcoin adoption, how do you penetrate the supply chain? How do you make it so that every single person in that supply chain can accept Bitcoin, but still can convert it to dollars? And then one day, you know, little by little, they'll start saying, oh, I'll just hold on to the Bitcoin. Oh, my merchant accepts Bitcoin, right? So if you could pay anybody in Bitcoin, that's the prerequisite to start accepting the Bitcoin. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, and so mechanically, m the Bitcoin moves from me as the customer, it moves from my Bitcoin wallet into the debit card of the Visa that's on file with Moon, which is going to be an account that you would maintain as as a Moon, as Moon the company. You're going to record an entry, Bitcoin hits the Bitcoin wallet that you own, and you would immediately at whatever exchange rate cat credit the debit card and then uh, and then run the transaction using that debit card number into the merchant's account. So I would imagine the transaction is 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 only waiting for both of those networks to synchronize. The Bitcoin Lightning Network has to synchronize and then the, the Visa MasterCard Network has to synchronize. Is that? Yeah. So, right? so, I mean, there's a few things, right? So you can create a card. You can go into our platform and say, I, you know, my purchase is for $47.12, right? If you want, you can create a one-time use virtual card for that exact amount. Uh, we'll pop up a QR code. You can pay with Lightning or you can pay on-chain. With on-chain, you're just going to wait a little while, right? But with Lightning, it's going to take about a second. You instantly get a virtual card with the, with the US dollar equivalent. And now you can use that to complete your purchase. Right? You can also create, uh, we support cards up to $1,000 in value. Create a $1,000 card, spend it down over time. You may say, why the $1,000 limit? Well, uh, there's no KYC requirement. It's the most private way you can spend your Bitcoin in the world. So, so when we design this thing, we really want to do it in such a way that would uphold, uphold, really uphold the values, right? And the biggest one you know, that people love about our platform is that privacy aspect and maintaining that. So com mm -hmm. combining, say, the Lightning Network with our card solution, um, it's huge for people who are saying, hey, you know, I, I like to keep my transaction private. Interesting. Uh, a couple of different areas I want to I want to go down. Uh, one would be visa approval to get a debit card transaction. They don't necessarily need to know what how you're receiving the funds to credit the debit card. However, knowing the world of AML and KYC, visa I'm sure does. Did, what was the process like? What, what did they? What did you have to do? What did you have to? Yeah, how integrated is that partnership? Yeah, so so the funny thing about it is that uh, when when I was it took years of just calling up banks on the phone back in the day and just saying, "Hey, I got this idea. We want to do this thing, Bitcoin, and we don't want to do the KYC. Here's how the law works. Blah blah blah. It's totally legal." And I'm like, you are a crazy person. They said I was nuts. Never going to happen. Uh, so finally, um, in 2019, I get on the phone with Visa when they were setting up the Visa crypto team, and uh, they were just like, "Let's do it. We got to make this happen." It was just like right time, right place. So once we got Visa on board, they, they tell the banks like, hey, you know, we're all good here. This is going to be great because the banks are really, they're very nervous about Visa, right? Mm. Because they are part of the Visa network and they have to make sure that they're in their good graces. They don't want to get cut out of the network. Um, but if Visa says it's cool, then it goes to the bank. The bank has their own compliance. But, but really, um, you know, having that Visa stamp of approval was, was really important for us. So getting that first, then we got our bank partnership. Uh, and we were able to go into the market and, and I mean, now I just talk to Visa all the time and we're, we're expanding our partnership. So beyond our consumer facing product that we offer right now, uh, we're now offering an API for businesses. So other Bitcoin and crypto companies that want to offer cards to their customers, uh, we're offering APIs to, uh, to power the, those solutions. And did you feel like that was a structural change that Visa made internally with regards to their crypto policies? Or was this somehow like moon specific to say, hey, we've done a, Obviously, sure. when they launched their crypto team, they're very much open to it. But was that like a broad policy, public policy change? Or is it like, hey, Moon is approved, go for sure. it? So there, there were two different things. Um, one was definitely specific to Moon, right place, right time, right investors, right? We, like Charlie Lee is one of our investors. We have a lot of big crypto investors. Uh, so that and added a lot of reputability to, to what we were trying to do. I, I just wasn't some stranger coming out of nowhere. Um, although it was, it was kind of, still a cold call. So, you know, that's kind of, a did you, is that, is that how you got a hold of him? Did you send him a yeah, cold email, yeah. cold call or cold yeah. email? I just, I, I just got a phone number. I called him up and then 
They no were like, let me put you through. And then, you know, some guys is like, just set up the crypto group and he's like, oh, perfect timing. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> but the, the other side, the other side was, I, I really think the payments networks are seeing the writing on the wall, right? And when you have the Bitcoin community and other crypto communities saying, we're going to disintermediate, we're going to take down Visa and MasterCard. They are the enemy. Um, well, that's got to make you a little nervous, you know? So, so both Visa and MasterCard and, and to a lesser extent, the other payment networks, they all have some aspect of their business now, which is focused on crypto. And whether that's CBDCs, Bitcoin, stable coins, you know, wh whatever it is. I mean, Visa bought an NFT, right? There's all these things that they're doing. Because frankly, a lot of these payment networks, specifically Visa and MasterCard, they, they, they kind of sit on their hands and print money, right? So they want to keep, you know, obviously you want to keep that, that, that uh, money printing machine running <laughs> so they can invest it in things like, hey, let's test out this new crypto thing see what that's all about so that, uh, you know, they don't go the way of Yahoo when Google came around. And they don't go the way the, the, the horse when the car came around. So I think they see the writing on the wall. They're investing heavily into this. And, uh, and, and there is really this kind of battle between, you know, Visa and MasterCard right now. And uh, Amex just recently got involved with the, the Opera card. But yeah. Are they really? I mean, are they really battling? Do you think they have sort of a cooperation where Visa Master kind of they're both kind of accepted everywhere? I almost think of them as almost indistinguishable. Like on some level, they represent the oligopoly of like Verizon, AT and T. But even then, there's a pretty clear difference in coverage. But aside from coverage on uh, your your ISP, it's not much of a difference. They're on the same level of throughput. With Visa Mastercard, it's even less. It's like I I can't remember a merchant I've gone into and they say, oh, we only accept Visa or we don't accept sure. MasterCard. Like you hear Amex and Discover as kind of the fringe networks. Yeah. Um, is there something going on there? Like, do they have some yeah. sort of agreement or yeah? <laughs> no, it's, it's actually it's actually government regulation forcing that to happen because uh, everyone oh. is required to have two options, right? So you can't go to a merchant that just has one option. You can't just accept Visa. You can't just accept MasterCard. Right. So if you're going to support two different types of payments networks, which is required, you're probably going to support both Visa and MasterCard. And that's also not exclusive to the primary payments networks. It actually also applies to ATM payment networks. You know, you don't think about those networks actually separate from uh, Visa and MasterCard. So there are other networks behind the scenes that are not branded in front of the consumer where there's also a legal requirement. There has to be more than one option. And I think just in the case of most folks, it's like, well, I want Visa and MasterCard, obviously, right? I don't, you know, I, you're not guaranteed your customer's going to have an Amex or a Discover, but mm. you got to have Visa and MasterCard, and then maybe you'll add some others on top of that. It's but, interesting. But, so it kind of consolidates on those two. Yeah. And there's, there's a certain level of cooperation in the sense that, I mean, there is competition. It's not as fierce as, as people may think they're, you know, not going like crazy head to head. We got to beat the other guy. They're both sitting on their hands, printing money. And they're also, the, these organizations were not created like regular businesses were created. They were actually networks formed from bank conglomerates that came together and said, Hey, let's form this network and then spun it out as its own independent corporation. Right. It's not like there was a founder and CEO. Um, so it, 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 these, mm -hmm. these organizations have a very weird history it's a, they, they, they're structured in a very unique way. And, um, you know, there's competition, right? There's kind of like a land grab. Oh, we're going to try this experiment here, this experiment there, but there's still thousands of, of crypto companies out there that don't work with either. Right. So, so that's where a company like us comes in with visa where, you know, say a, a small crypto startup wants to work with visa. Hey, I've got this cool little project. You know, visa is not going to give you the time of day generally. Um, so they rely on partners like us to say, Hey, okay, we'll onboard you. We're going to take care of the smaller guys onboard you to the visa network. We're going to handle all the complexity. Normally what would take you like, it took like three years to get, to get set up on this stuff. It's a little bit better now, but it still takes maybe a year for the average crypto exchange to like start getting cards in the hands of consumers. Um, you know, we're trying to take that down to, you know, one month process and a two week process and a one week process and do it in such a way that, you know, you're not going to be, uh, you know, uh, kept out of uh, mm. engaging in this activity just because you're too small. So that's so do, so does this does this like um, does this B two B API centric st business strategy more interesting to you than consumer mm -hmm. growth? Personally, I love the consumer side, uh, but we yeah. found there was just like an enormous amount of demand for the B two B side. 
uh, I think it's really cool to build a cool product that customers like and you talk to the consumers. And I mean, that's just where my mind goes. Um, but when someone comes to you and says, let's sign one contract, and I'm going to bring you a ton of revenue in one go. It's hard to say no. And then when you have like 75 companies come to you and ask for the same thing, you're like, I should probably do that thing. They're probably, saying, you know, mm -hmm. it's the market to mm -hmm. saying something to me. So, um, yeah, yeah. You know, and then it's just, you know, you talk to every, everybody you talk to is just like so excited about it. And I was like, this makes a lot of sense, even from a defensibility perspective, right? Like, okay, well, someone's going to compete with me eventually. Well, let me just have them use my API. Take three years or use my API, you know, and then I'll just power all my competitors. Great, you know? Yeah. So, um, it w so you, you think of it as powering the competitors. So it, what would be a typical, like, B2B implementation of this? So there's a bunch of different types, right? And not everybody would be a competitor, right? We're in a very niche area on like privacy focused payments, right? But, um, you know, like any exchange that would want to get on board, they don't already have a card, right? And specifically what we're working on a lot is developing markets. So we have US, uh, we're doing North America. That That's not hard. It's actually a very competitive market. There's a lot of companies that do that. But when you go into the developing world, uh, Latin America, Africa, Southeast Asia, there's not a lot of activity going on there. Like, you know, a crypto exchange in Africa really has a hard time getting access to cards. One of the biggest card issuers in Africa shut down recently because they couldn't deal with their fraud properly. They were a mass wow. card company. So, um, you know, in Southeast Asia, you know, there's some huge uh, um, uh, crypto applications and very popular wallets that there isn't a bank partner and card issuer available to offer them cards. So uh, what we're doing in, with our expansion is really you know, in, in many regions will be the first card issuer that's able to work with crypto companies. So there's a lot of really exciting opportunities. Um, we built out all the technology is really just a matter of, frankly, it's approvals and bureaucracy and red tape dealing with banks, Visa, you know, the 17 other organizations mm -hmm. that are involved in, in putting one of these things together. It ends up being wildly complicated. Yeah. So in, say, a uh, developing area like Africa, if you had, say, um... I'm picturing Nigeria. There's just a large crypto focused oh, country. Mm -hmm. You would be, it would be the merchants typically are not offering a visa option as a payment method. So people dominant pay, foreign payment is cash, I imagine. And then you're, you're going in there on behalf of visa to say, Hey, merchant, uh, work with us. We'll spin you up a visa account. It'll allow people to pay in Bitcoin. What we're doing is saying, Hey, you own, you have a bit, you run a Bitcoin wallet specifically for Nigerian consumers, or you have a crypto exchange mm -hmm. in Nigeria. We can give you cards for your consumers so they can pay where visas accepted. Now you're hundred percent right. You go to every, you know, probably 10% of the stores have, you know, accept visa in Nigeria, if not less. Right. But where do Nigerian shop online? Right. Well, they're going to shop on Amazon, just like everybody else shops on Amazon. And what they often do is there's no Amazon Nigeria. They shop on Amazon UK or Amazon Germany, and then they ship it down to Nigeria. Right. Uh, oh, really? Yeah, same things like people in Nigeria, they want Netflix, they want Spotify. They want all these products and services that we all kind of take for granted. But a bunch of people in Nigeria, they don't have a way to make that payment so they can just stream music. Right. So even though there's all this awesome technology and amazing tech companies out there offering exactly what they want, the biggest problem that they're facing is like getting the money into the hands of that overseas company so they can actually consume that product. So it's really a win-win for everybody, mm -hmm. right? Payment networks expand. The uh, tech companies or, or retailers selling online generate more revenue and the consumers get exactly what they want. Interesting. And why, if they're... I, I would imagine Visa has, I can see the problem if Visa is trying to expand into an area that doesn't have the, maybe the security infrastructure or the ability to enforce, uh, you know, somebody who's not paying their bills and they have accumulated credit on a credit card, but could Visa, why doesn't Visa have a vast network even in developing countries mm -hmm. using just the debit card rails? Because debit card to me is just digital cash. Is there fraud prevalent in debit cards as well? And if so, how would it, how does it happen? Yeah. So, so fraud comes in many forms in terms of chargebacks specifically is a big one. Uh, there's fraud in terms of, uh, you know, people will claim all sorts of ridiculous things, uh, use a card in somebody else's name, fake their identity. Like it gets absolutely ridiculous. Um, 
you know, free trials, you get a free trial and then you try to, you know, it, it you know, it just gets absolutely bonkers, mm -hmm. right? There's so many, I mean, I, I don't like to tell people exactly what fraud stuff exists because it gives people ideas, you know, but it gets really, I feel like people are, there's, th th there's everything, there's so much, everyone's trying, there's so, people who are doing this are probably not listening That's to this right. podcast and B, they, they, they probably are spending all day yeah. figuring out the, the, every edge case possible yeah. i mean and, and also just the way the traditional payments networks work like uh chargebacks for example like you know uh consumer uh protection laws require you like you have to file a chargeback if the customer asks for it right so here's a perfect example mm -hmm. you go to a kiosk at a, a pop-up shop in manhattan right and you buy something for like 200 bucks you go home you call up your bank and say I didn't buy this product. Somebody stole my card information. What happens is they have to file a chargeback. There's no way for the merchant to, to really prove this or anything, right? You just kind of swiped your card and, uh, and then you're going to, you know, they're going to give you your money back and you got a free product and they're going to send you a new card, right? That's one, that's an example of fraud, right? Mm. So you can imagine, mm. you know, not the stereotype, but you know, there are a lot of these Nigerian print scammers out there, right? And Nigeria has or has had this reputation with scamming. There is probably this subculture there that's, that's um, you know, very much into scamming. You know, probably had people going to work every day and that was their whole job was to, to scam people, right? Uh, like, like the call centers and everything. So it's really, um, you know, there's a problem there, but what we do, like we, we've built out a lot of our own fraud detection technology and, and things we structured it, even uh, in a legal way, differently than other car programs are structured. So that we're able to mitigate against a lot of this type of fraud. So, so kind of zooming out. The fun, the funny thing about this is, that, you know, I really got into this for Bitcoin, and then I really find myself now all I do stuff is with traditional payments networks. You know, it ends up the Bitcoin stuff mm -hmm. is surprisingly easy compared to the traditional payments ne network stuff, because the Bitcoin is open, permissionless. You just kind of program it; it's open source. You can see it and you just do it. You don't have to ask for permission. And then with the traditional networks, it's like everything is asked for permission. Everything is red tape. Everything is approvals and, and, and regulation and just like, it's insane right now. The good thing for me as, as someone running the business is, I mean, it's created a moat because not many people have the patience or the willingness to deal with this specifically, you know, if you're drawn to Bitcoin or crypto, you probably are doing it because you want to get away from the traditional world and away from all the red tape and you want that freedom. So kind of the value that we bring is kind of merging the old and the new together and, and kind of. You know, I, the way I think of it is kind of we, we bear the pain, we shoulder the burden so that other entrepreneurs don't have to. Yeah. Yeah. It really is like two different oceans. I mean, you can swim in the, the crypto ocean or swim in the fiat currency ocean, and then you can take a bucket and you can move your water between one and the other, which is kind of how I think of exchanges. It's like, well, I'm going to send a wire transfer from my bank to the custody bank of the exchange. And, and that's, that's like not a, it's it's great, but it's it's not. It, it could be shut down tomorrow. I mean, if the government were to say, "Hey, we view Bitcoin as a threat, and we want to preserve," you know, inflation is becoming a serious thing. People are evading the U.S. dollar. They're moving to Bitcoin. We got to mm -hmm. clamp down. It's like, okay, you shut down Coinbase, Kraken, Gemini, and a few others, and then what? Does the U.S. market mm -hmm. starve and just can't move money and out of it? And then people are exchanging like local mm -hmm. bitcoins. So. Yeah, that certainly that regression certainly seems possible. So the the more, frankly, the more companies like yours that exist that integrate both networks together are super freaking valuable. Um, all right. So what else? What else is exciting from your perspective? We covered the general flow of funds. We covered the rough like mm -hmm. demographic landscape of Visa, Mastercard, and then emerging markets. Do you view? Um, I mean, a couple of things I'm, I'm curious to get your thoughts on. If you're Visa MasterCard or knowing them to the extent mm -hmm. that you do, they certainly, I would imagine, are now activated mm -hmm. to at least preserve their market share and maybe even possibly view crypto as a growth mm -hmm. opportunity. Do, do, you, do you, I mean, my assumption is that the executive team in these companies are thinking about how to... Uh, to, to block crypto from becoming a true disruptor as opposed to adopting it and really doubling down on the technology, just I, I given, think it's actually you know, the sway I think it's that they want to double down it oh, with yeah? the technology. At least, at least the folks that I speak with, you know, there could be different 
different parts, mm -hmm. right? One trying to take it down and one trying to work with it and they kind of hedge their bets, right? Mm -hmm. But I, I really do think they want to go with it because if you think about it, a lot of the stuff that they're working on can be good for them, right? So say, for example, one of the things Visa's done um, is, uh, uh, with, I think it was a partnership with, with Crypto.com. They, they started piloting settlement in USDC, right? So normally, if you're going to do settlement uh, uh, between banks, it, you know, it's a wire and it's going to settle at midnight, right? So you can settle once per day and that's it. You settle USDC on Ethereum, you could do it many times per day, right? So that is now like just a pure technical solution. Hey, we're going to use the Ethereum network so we can do, just settle funds between financial institutions, right? Wow, that, that solved one of our problems. We can offer superior service now, right? So that was like, that was a big thing. The other thing, if you look at CBDCs, all the payment networks are looking at CBDCs, right? Governments are talking to them and saying, hey, you should, you need to get on board with this stuff. This is what we're going to do. Please support it, right? So they're looking at that. Okay, that's another growth opportunity. And then just in general, they look at what are all the new, you know, obviously you had fintechs, right? You had buy now, pay later, which was huge, right? And, and that was a huge growth area for payments networks. And now they're saying crypto is the next big growth area for the payment networks, right? How do we support all these new fintech companies that are coming out, uh, and get them onto our network and getting cards in their hands? And Visa has a, a, a stated goal, which is we want a Visa card in the hand of every crypto wallet. That's it. You know, like that is their, that is their goal. So, um, which makes sense. And I think, like I said before, they see the writing on the wall, it's coming. It's obviously the future, right? So like, you got to get with it, you know? And I think they're, they're taking the right approach. They, mm -hmm. They're going with the innovation. They're saying, how can we support? How can we, how can we, you know, be a part of this future as opposed to fight against it? Do you think that they are seeing a future? Because the definition of the future might be nuanced, right? How, like overarching crypto will play a big part, but then more specifically, how does it get implemented and when and, and how, what does it look like? I would imagine that Visa and the banks have a close relationship and incentive to have people have credit cards, specifically credit cards that are connected with the banks because they make interest if you default on the payments. And some credit cards have subscriptions. Is are, are they looking at a future that's inevitable as people have bank accounts and they have crypto accounts and they make transactions at merchants in some sort of combination of these two account origination sources or are, are the banks and, and these credit cards is kind of a stopgap? Well, the, the banks are uh, going to start holding Bitcoin. That's the next step. The, the only reason a lot of banks are not holding Bitcoin is the government won't let them. Um, you have a yeah, really? that's, that's a, that's one of the biggest Is there a specific uh, rule? I, I'm not sure the specifics. It, I believe it has to do with FDIC. Um, but there's, wow. there are a lot of, yeah. with the bank, a lot of banks are just not comfortable holding it or they're preparing or they've built the technical rails to hold it. The partnerships, they they're like have whole groups around how are we going to bank people on Bitcoin, but they have not been able to launch it yet because they're waiting for regulatory clarity. Because the one thing as a bank you don't want to risk is your banking license. That is a hard thing to get. You do not want to lose it, right? Mm. So they're very risk-averse organizations, but the banks that are a little more uh, risk and opportunity-seeking are, are going hard down this path. And then obviously you have the, the, the you know, real crypto banks seeking their own banking license. You know, obviously wildly capitally intensive, but there are a few of those out there. Yeah. Yeah. I've even heard of the strategy of uh, like a crypto exchange buying existing mm -hmm. fledgling bank and then just completely, you know, wiping it clean, starting from mm -hmm. scratch, using the license. Uh, do you view Bitcoin as the dominant currency that will be offered when this starts to happen? Or I imagine the stepping stone is like use USDC or Tether, yeah. or something that's so tied to the US it's dollar. It's going to be Bitcoin first. That's the infrastructure that they're all yeah, I think oh, yeah? USDC is in interesting from a settlement perspective, but given everything that happened recently with uh, you know, all these yield farming and, and you know mm. what stable coins are real, which ones are going to collapse, right? Like I think that, that definitely freaked out a lot of banks. Um, I think USDC still kind of has the reputability, but that's really the only one that I think has some reputability in their eyes. Um, and, uh, and I think, you know, it, it really is Bitcoin is going to be the next thing in, in terms of what the SEC views as, you know, not a security. 
right? Um, Bitcoin is at the top of that list. So that makes them very clear. And then in terms of stable coins, I think there needs to be uh, very clear stable coin regulations that have not come out yet for them to feel comfortable doing that. But I'm not aware of any banks that have like really worked on any stable coin infrastructure whatsoever. If anything, they're investing in mm. uh, CBDC technologies first because they know for a fact that's coming down the line and the governments are telling them you need to prepare for this, right? And obviously banks want to be the first on board with that if it does actually become something that a government launches, not necessarily in the US, but, but in whichever country that bank operates. You know, that is a huge opportunity to be one of the first on board because you're going to end up having a lot of assets and you're going to end up having like a, a pretty uh, interesting first mover advantage. Hmm. Do you view um, a, a significant threat to Bitcoin as a government change in, just call it attitude or disposition yeah. towards Bitcoin where they start to view it as a threat? Or, or do you view us as kind of like, Lar very largely past that. Sure. I mean, it's difficult to know how, how things change in mm -hmm. society, especially when economics get funky and people get really, mm -hmm. you know, tight or, you know, things change dramatically with inflation and yeah. all the pressures that come with that. Uh, yeah. I mean, it, it, it would be too. very difficult if all you know, the government suddenly said no crypto exchanges, right? They could shut that down. They shut, they could shut down the on ramps and off ramps, like you said, and everybody's relying on local Bitcoins at that point, which again, the regular, you know, the government has come after local Bitcoins even, and that has been a struggle, right? Mm -hmm. There's only mm -hmm. a handful of other options out there. They can eliminate all of the um, uh, exemptions that exist for, you know, no KYC Bitcoin ATMs and, and what we do with our cars, not have a KYC requirement, mm -hmm. right? These are all exemptions that we're falling under because, you know, the government in their good graces have allowed us to operate in such small amounts with a little bit of freedom still in this country. You know? <laughs> so it's, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. you know, but, but again, those are things that can be taken away, right? So, so I think it, it's important for us to kind of like hold the line as much as possible, right? Like obviously, we'd like to push like, hey, let's increase these limits, right? Because inflation, these limits are going to mean less and less over time. Um, hey, let's, let's push back on some of these restrictions. Hey, let's push back on the SEC. Let's not call everything a security. Right. Wouldn't that be great if we were able to, like, not have all these problems? Um, but, uh, you know, my, my, my feeling is that it will get worse over time, probably. It's just a matter of how bad it gets. But, but so far, I think, uh, you know, mm. th there's been a, 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 an embrace of it. And, and hopefully the network effects of Bitcoin work to its benefit in this sense. And we get more people in politics who hold Bitcoin and, you know, for selfish reasons, just want us to see it succeed. That's kind of like the last hope i guess mm -hmm. yeah 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 it does seem like the, the government i mean the united states just conceptually seems to export uh culture mm -hmm. currency certainly with the u.s dollar um and i mean those are probably our biggest exports if you think about it so to let as people move you know you build a great company and allows people to move uh into bitcoin or from bitcoin mm -hmm. into usd the rails vice versa is is happening it seems like we slide away, like smart money slides away from U.S. dollars as the as the fiat, which in many cases is probably people earning less money because they realize inflation is more serious than maybe sure. people who aren't paying attention uh, would realize. If if there is this backlash, which I, I still am having a difficult time, like getting a mental model for how likely that is. But if there is a backlash where it's like crypto versus Bitcoin. Uh, sorry, uh, sure. U.S. government versus Bitcoin. Does that? Ha, ha, it seems like a formidable battle, <laughs> for one. I mean, there's enough people on the Bitcoin side where I could see that being like a strong resistance. Like, I'm sure you'd probably join your local protest and marching in the street, as would I. And but it would be it would be hard. Like, it's you know, the U.S. government is going to be a difficult, um, sure. you know, entity to persuade. Does it does that increase the price of Bitcoin or does that decrease it? Do you feel like it makes it more valuable? Do you have a mental model around that? Yeah. So worst case scenario, right? Big terrorist attack completely funded with Bitcoin, right? Immediately government comes in and oh, says, Oh yeah, we're we're done with this. All of Congress has to get behind it. They have no choice, too much pressure, all like freeze all exchanges. We can't allow this to happen, right? Price of Bitcoin absolutely plummets because what are you going to do with it? You know, like, right. You know, right. I, I don't even know how you know the price of Bitcoin, I guess, internationally. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, 
And like, that's kind of worst case scenario. And then how do you recover from that? I think that would be just kind of worst case scenario. And hopefully there'd be, you know, enough lobbying to kind of go ahead and do that. But who would pay for all that lobbying with, you know, people holding a lot of Bitcoin, you just lost a lot of value, right? So I, I think still long term, long, long, long term, it's still really good, right? But that would take a, a huge, huge hit to the movement and, and to the Bitcoin price. I think it would still recover long term because I think Bitcoin is going to last longer probably than the U.S. government. But, you know, it's uh, it, it, it would be a big hiccup in the road that obviously we, we don't want to see happen. I would say it will inevitably happen at some point. Something terrible that was paid with Bitcoin will inevitably happen because something bad happens when you pay with any currency. Right. It's just a matter of statistics. That's it. Right. Uh, it's just a matter of, you know, how much penetration do we get by then? What is the national mood? You know, how do politicians see it? Are they educated? Which I don't think many of them have a clue what's going on with this thing, right? Um, but uh, if that happens, and then you know, you, it would have you know, funded a terrorist attack, and then all of a sudden, yeah. you know, the only people using it are, are North Korean people who want to evade sanctions, and then you're gonna have a real hard <laughs> road yeah. to recovery. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At a certain point, it it wouldn't be, it would be dead on arrival. Uh, yeah, that's, that's an interesting perspective. I could see it being almost the pseudo TSA where there's like, uh, you know, we, we kind of view like, uh, you know, people wearing belts, people wearing shoes as, you know, the enemy and TSA is the, is the agent of action there to you know, make sure everyone is completely assessed from a security standpoint. And then you, this is after nine 11, I'm kind of thinking of the reactionary effects there as being similar, the Bank Secrecy Act becomes like ratcheted up. You have anti money laundering laws that just get more aggressive. I don't know. Do you get a sense for the pendulum swing? Like, it, it, part of me feels like the swing is towards more uh, financial freedom. You know, we had the Reg CF program where the government said you can publicly solicit for private companies, the accredited investor laws. Uh, not that those change, but that people who were not accredited investors could invest in, in private companies. Mm -hmm. It seems like things are shifting in that direction. Do you, do you agree with that? Do you see counter evidence? Uh, I, I think there's a small shift in that direction right now. It's very, very tiny. Mm. Like what you're saying, like, you know, okay, we're going to let a few more people <laughs> yeah. can invest in companies now, you know, okay, just, just open the door a little bit. Right. Uh, I, I, I wish they just opened the floodgates already, but you know, we, we got to deal with what we got to deal with. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think there's a movement happening right now, right, in terms of freedom and privacy. And it very much coincides with Bitcoin. It very much coincides with, uh, you know, a lot, a lot of technologies on, on both sides, anti-privacy and, and pro-privacy. And more and more, I think it's going to be a part of the national debate. More and more, these are going to be hot topics. Um, you know, I really like this, this idea, you know, I don't know if you've heard, like, you know, Bitcoin is Venice. This whole idea that it's kind of like the new intellectual hotbed is now within the Bitcoin community. That's where you have the most curious, open-minded people innovating and, and, and kind of philosophizing and coming up with new ideas. Um, and I think there's going to be you know more and more movement there. I always give this example of a friend of the family who's completely non-technical. Um, she you know she calls me whenever her printer breaks and, and oh something's wrong. I don't know what I'm doing. And she calls me and she says uh, you know can I should I get a privacy phone? Privacy phone. Like, I don't trust Apple and I don't trust Google with my information anymore because what everything that's got, they're spying on me. I don't want to have anything to do with it. She uses a VPN for everything and she only messages me on Signal. You know, what is going on? This, this mm. <laughs> you know, mm. this is just like my mom's friend. So when I see something like that, people who are just like completely not technical whatsoever, asking me about privacy phones, using VPNs and messaging only on Signal, like there's, there's definitely a movement going on. There's definitely, it's become, people are becoming much, much more aware of it, right? And uh, whether it's, it's like a net neutrality or it's freedom of speech on the internet or censorship on social media, right? And, and it's on all angles of the political spectrum. The digital world is kind of becoming more of the forefront of, of everything. You know, what are your freedoms on the internet and what you can say and who you can transact with and what you can do, um, you know, that, that is going to increasingly become a part of the conversation. And, and you know, uh, we have to kind of put up a, a bit of a fight there and say, hey, this is what we want to do. And, and hopefully we can, you know, how amazing would it be if we set the cultural norm as like, we don't need the BS anymore. We reject that, right? If we said that money is speech, 
and you're restricting where I can put my money, aren't you restricting my free, my free speech and my First Amendment rights, right? Like maybe that's an argument that people are going to start making. I don't know. Uh, or maybe there'll be another terrorist attack or maybe something will happen with, with, you know, something that people don't like with the flow of funds and, and it'll just tighten up even more. You know, I'm a little pessimistic and I think that, uh, you know, the world tends towards, uh, you know, we, we have spurts of, of kind of like an explosion of freedom generally involved in revolutions and, uh, uh, you know, changing of, of uh, government systems and leadership. Um, and then you have just like kind of the slow deterioration of freedom over time and the, the decay of systems. And, you know, we're kind of like this long <laughs> existing empire now in the U.S. where, you know, you have more regulations on the books than, than anybody even understands at this point. So there's almost like this... Uh, uh, there's a cultural decay, there's a government decay, there's an institutional decay that's all happening simultaneously right now. You know, I would love to see if we can turn it around. Not entirely sure how it's going to happen, but, you know, we'll, we'll see. Mm, yeah. Well, it seems like there's a, there's a pattern to it that I, I think of less about freedom, but more along the political access of uh, consolidation of power. It's like the expression, long united must divide, uh, yeah. long united must divide, long divided must unite where it's, mm -hmm. it's this kind of oscillating effect in society that mm -hmm. people's identification kind of becomes centralized. And that's when power mm -hmm. becomes centralized. That's when establishments happen and governments happen on a federal level. And then they, they become stagnant, stale. They can't quite iterate on the demands of the people. And th then, then we're at where we're at now, which is kind of in this like transition phase to a, a new either a deteriorating organization built upon old frameworks or a new type of organization built upon new ones. And, and maybe we're like the tectonic plates are somewhere it's still shifting there. Um, mm. do, what role do you see uh, the government playing? Like in an ideal world, mm. in today's world, because uh, it does change as technology changes and problems change. But where do you, what's your general take on like the extent to which uh, government is, would be useful? So it is useful, right? I, but I think we're going into a direction where there, there are parts of the government that don't have to be under the purview of the government, right? So there's the whole idea within the Bitcoin community of separation of money and state, similar to how we separate religion from state, right? Like this is just the next path towards kind of decentralization of governance, right? And if you kind of look at the uh, overall crypto world and maybe kind of like the I want to say maybe like the Andreessen Horowitz view of the world, right? You have like the the decentralization of everything. Everything's a network. Everything's decentralized. You know, um, there's a, um, I, I think the government will play less and less a role, or at least there will be less and less of a need for them to play a role. They may want to continue playing that role, right? But there's less of a need for them in reality to actually play that role. Um, so for example, Hey, you don't have to manage the money supply anymore. We got a better solution or, Hey, you don't have to manage that. I mean, I think it's kind of a crazy idea that we, we elect one government that just kind of does everything right. Instead of like multiple overlapping organizations, like one that does parks and one that does military and one that does health or, you know what I'm saying? It's a little bizarre. There's all just one organization that does everything. Maybe the person in charge of the military should not be the person in charge of national parks, you know, mm. those are kind of two different skill sets, right? And I think that's this idea of DAOs and that's the idea of all this kind of like, how do you structure and organize decentralized organizations irrespective of, of geographic bounds, right? I think that's kind of the next wave. Um, same thing with voting, same thing with all these things, like in theory, right? Like, oh, use the blockchain for voting, use it, you know, wow, okay, a lot of complication there. I think a lot of people jumped into that years ago thinking like, this is the future. We're going to have all this awesome decentralized stuff. And then you kind of really look at it and you're like, okay, all those things failed. This is like way more complicated than anybody had originally thought. Um, almost nothing is actually decentralized. Uh, most everything that says, says they're decentralized is like wildly centralized. So, you know, I think this march towards decentralization, uh, changing the governance systems, uh, it's a very, I think it's extremely long-term project that is going to take, I don't know, 10, 20, 30, 50 years to, to get somewhere significant, right? 
and people are just, we're just playing right now we're it's like we just figured out electricity and and like we're thinking about going to the moon you know mm. and it's like all right well there's a lot of steps right we mm. can't just we can't just go from point a to point z just like that so um and i think that's why a lot of people are so gung-ho just like focus on bitcoin and that's because it's like okay well this is the one thing that is decentralized it's our one chance like let's get the money thing down first and then let's move to some of these other problems that we can solve you know um are, are you in that camp do, do you feel uh that i guess it's it's probably a spectrum perspective but certainly some people are bitcoin maximalists where they only want to talk uh you know they they downplay or or like mm -hmm. shit shit talk other projects mm -hmm. um how, where do you come sure. come on that do yeah you... i i call myself a bitcoin most of us, right i think oh, that's has, a good one i think it has the most promise I think it has <laughs> the most likely chance of succeeding is the most likely one to go up the most in value. You're right. Like it, 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 but I'm, I am not like, I, I am, I try to be like a humble person in my opinions. Right. So I would say, yeah, I think Bitcoin's the future. I'm dedicating my life to this. My whole business is built around this. Like I try to live on Bitcoin. Right. But there's a chance of a black swan event happening and then Bitcoin that doesn't succeed. You know, like there's some crazy stuff that could happen. There could be something new that comes out. Right. And at the same time, there are interesting technological innovations happening elsewhere. Who am I to say that, like, if a business wants to use a distributed ledger to solve a logistics problem, who am I to say that's stupid and not worth your time, right? Mm -hmm. Like, well, I'm not in the logistics industry, but, like, go ahead. It's a technology that could solve your problem. Why would I, why would I uh, not be on board with that, you know? So I think there's a lot of interesting mm -hmm. things. I am very pro-innovation, but I'm also, you know, I'm most excited about Bitcoin. Um, because I yeah. think if that is the killer, everybody's like, what's the killer application for blockchain? And it's like, hello, it's right in front of you. <laughs> you know, it's the money. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and there's plenty of other applications. Great, wonderful voting and betting and this and that. Great. I'm super excited for all of it. Right. And maybe it'll even be built on the Bitcoin blockchain. I don't know. But I'm also, a, 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 I would say I'm a, I'm a freedom maximalist, you know? So I really like the idea of a lot of competing solutions, right? Because if nothing competed with Bitcoin, what would be the reason to innovate on Bitcoin? You know, if there's, hey, Litecoin did this thing and we really like it. So let's implement part of that into Bitcoin, right? Or, hey, Ethereum has this really cool smart contract thing or NFTs. A lot of people in Bitcoin hate NFTs and thinks it's stupid. But you know what? Now there's a whole bunch of Bitcoin NFT companies that are doing NFT on Bitcoin, on the Lightning Network, right? And now they're like, oh, it's actually kind of cool, right? So, so you, mm -hmm. I like this innovation. It's kind of very much a free market approach. Uh, I, I'm never going to, uh, uh, you know, be negative towards somebody for innovating and trying something new. It's different if they're like obviously trying to scam people out of their money. But, uh, but I think there's a lot of fun, there's, you know, I'm open-minded and I think uh, there's a lot of cool yeah. stuff people are doing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, in those examples, it doesn't come at a cost. Like if you go and build something, great, go and do it. It's like in, in many ways, it just replicates the patterns of, of nature with with survival of the fittest and the theory of evolution, where you have a lot of experiments running simultaneously, none of which are uh, coming at a cost of limited resources to others. And then you sort of see what works. What's your, what's your take on the lightning network? Mm -hmm. uh, it certainly has the vision to be the, the cash version. I mean, I think of kind of conceptually, it seems like historically we've, we've largely separated store value in gold and then the day-to-day -day transactional layer as cash or ESD. Mm -hmm. They, they, do they have to be separated? Um, and is Bitcoin to the Lightning Network an appropriate separation? And like, why don't we hear more about the Lightning Network too? What's, what's your yeah. dissection yeah. of it? I love the Lightning Network. Uh, I, I started building on the Lightning Network in 2019. One of the first companies now we run the, I think as of today, like the 19th largest node on the network. Um, really big on Lightning Network. As soon as I heard about it, I'm like, well, this is obviously the future, right? Like if you believe Bitcoin is the future and you're going to live on Bitcoin, well, a solution that makes it fast and inexpensive to send and private, it's like, it's a no brainer. And there's really no competition out there, right? You have, um, there are other second layers on Bitcoin. None of them have the adoption level, right? Uh, and most of the other second layers are focused on smart contracts and not specifically moving money. So. Uh, I, th I think it's huge. Like we, we use Lightning Network very heavily. A lot of people love to pay off Lightning Network because we pop up a QR code, you scan it with your phone or, you know, if you're on mobile, you click a button and now you just send Bitcoin. It just happened, right? We support, mm. we support on-chain Bitcoin also. 
you're going to wait an hour, sometimes two or three hours, depending on how, how congested the network is at the time, right? That's not a great experience. Maybe that's great for settlement between financial institutions. You want that finality on the blockchain. But for the lightning, hey, I, I, I want to buy ice cream, right? I think about it practically. I need to go to McDonald's and get fast food, and I want to pay with Bitcoin. Okay, I can't do that on chain because I can double spend, right? I, you can't give me the food until it's settled. So I have to wait at least 10 minutes for one confirmation. You should probably wait three, so I'm waiting 30 minutes on average, probably more mm -hmm. than that. just doesn't work, right? Um, the other thing with kind of the, the on-chain versus lightning is privacy, right? You have chain analysis out there now. Uh, chain analysis, I'll be careful. Chain analysis is mm -hmm. critical. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, they can track where all the money goes. The government loves Bitcoin for that purpose. Oh, this is even better yeah, than cash. Yeah. We can trace where all the money's going, right? So, yeah. you know, if you're in Bitcoin and you're like, I love the privacy aspect and it really, you know, freedom and all this cool stuff. Uh, and then you're like, oh, wait a second, they can track it better than cash. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so it's like, well, Lightning, yeah, Network, yeah. Lightning Network does a pretty good job of solving that, right? Uh, it's very scalable. Uh, in theory, it will be able to do more transactions per second than Visa, MasterCard and everything else combined. Uh, it's completely peer to peer. Um, so it's a very slow going ne network. I think that's one of the interesting things about it. If you compare the lightning network to another layer one, it's not growing as fast, right? Because what happens with layer ones, they raise a, a boatload of VC money. They got billions of dollars. They do loans. They're giving you 18% APY, right? Well, on the lightning network, there's no token. There's no, you know, there's nothing that you're going to like get rich quick or anything. So it's very slow growing. Um, but I think that makes it very resilient. You know, and you can generate revenue from it by operating nodes and, and you put your funds into channels and there's all these market effects. But, you know, maybe you'll you'll get like a reasonable return, of, I don't know, two to three percent. APY. You know, you're not, you know. Give me the give me the quick like yeah. give me the quick like technical breakdown, how you explain what lightning and network is. Network is. Right. So uh, I run a node, you run a node. What we do is we open up a channel between us. All the channel is is a multi-signature wallet. It's an on-chain multi-signature wallet where we both commit some amount of Bitcoin. And that wallet says, how much of it is allocated to me and how much of it is allocated to you, right? So I can say, I have one Bitcoin, you have zero Bitcoin in this channel. And I have to pay you 0.5 Bitcoin. I just update the state of that channel to say, now I have 0.5 and you have 0.5. That's it. So it's just this instant, we're just updating between two parties, the amounts. Now, if you, now what makes it a network is that we're all kind of connected in a graph, right? So Bob wants to send me money. Actually, Bob wants to send you money through me because I'm the node that connects you to. So he sends 0.5 to me through my channel with Bob, and then I send 0.5 to you through uh, my channel with you. I and I, the amount, total amount of Bitcoin that I have between all my channels is still the same. But he sent me some Bitcoin and you got it. And the interesting thing is it's not even the same Bitcoin and it's not settled onto the blockchain. So eventually you close the channel and it settles all those back and forths, right? And one Bitcoin transaction on chain. And that's it. Mm -hmm. So so it really mimics exactly what a lot of the payment networks do today, where you have all those back and forth at a small level, like within Venmo or, you know, your, your um, uh, uh, what's the other one? Any of those like interbank, uh, Zelle or something. Yeah, right? yeah, Zelle, yeah that's a good yeah. example. So you do all this back and forth. And at the end of the day, the bank settles with all their other peers within the Visa network or the ACH network or the wire network and saying, okay, in total between our millions of customers, you owe me $2 billion and I owe you this much billions and I owe that guy. And that's it. And they just settle at the end of the day and they send each other uh, CSV files or flat files or something. And that's how they, that's how they figure it all out. Mm -hmm. you know? uh, so this is just mm -hmm. like a way, way more advanced uh, method of doing that decentralized. You can run a lightning network on a raspberry Pi. Um, you can run it over the Tor network, right? So it really shields payments from prying eyes. There, there's, it's not as private as it could be. Um, it's not like Monero. It's not like that crazy. Mm -hmm. But at scale, it just like it'd be like impossible to trace these payments through the network. Mm. And is it a is it a chronological update, or is it after some amount of data and transactions that get uploaded to Bitcoin? Uh, uh, main the, when, what, you mean when the channels, well, like when it settles to the network? So it's just whenever uh, one or both of those parties decide to close the channel. In many circumstances, they may never close 
as a oh, okay um like they're they're not you're not required to uh you just may do it every once in a while um uh, because it you know you have to store the 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 state updates of those channels so you close it every once in a while open up a new one cost you whatever on chain mm. a couple of bucks fee but uh Got it. Got it. So if you if you went into fast food, bought a bought a McDonald's mm-hmm. hamburger, you open up a channel with that merchant. They you send them a point one Bitcoin. They they confirm that you sent it, and then yeah, so, and then that's what's necessary. Yeah, it's like it's yeah. a, it's an instant type of thing, right? So it's like you scan the QR code. What that does in that network, that point one Bitcoin goes through all those channels to that receiving party. Boom! I got it, and now. uh Customer, no. Oh, hey, it, that was fast, mm-hmm. right? And they actually mm-hmm. do uh, some. Some folks did tests where you could uh, uh, compare like a Visa card to a Lightning Network payment. Lightning Network payments faster. It, would the channel be closed out automatically in that example? Like you leave McDonald's, go eat yeah, your burger. You don't have to the, close it because you know. It, yeah, just, it's not like you have a direct channel with with the McDonald's, right? Like you're going to have a, a, a channel mm-hmm. with uh, the organization that maybe that provides you your wallet. Or maybe it's an exchange. You know, a lot of exchanges crack in and OKCoin okay have have Lightning Network support now, right? And they are managing all this liquidity and channels. You don't have to think about it, right? Um, mm. You just know that it's coming out of your wallet and it's going into theirs. And it's as simple as that. Um, you know, but if you want to get more effective, you can. Yeah. And so, and the exchanges will adopt. Is, is there a reason why or is it just a matter of rollout? Why? Uh, I, yeah. I'm thinking managing like, like running a lightning yeah. node is not as simple as running a regular Bitcoin node. It's far more complicated. There's more mm-hmm. active management with these channels, um, making sure you have the right liquidity. So even with the exchanges that have added support for lightning network, there are limits in place. Uh, I, I believe on OKCoin okay most recently, you could only send, I want to say a hundred thousand sats, point one Bitcoin, um, and at, 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 at a time. And there was like some limit per day that you could send, right? Because you have to manage all this liquidity and it gets actually, it gets pretty complicated on the back end of managing this. So like as a payments company to always have inbound liquidity channels with Bitcoin that you can constantly accept. Um, there, there's some active management, there's the right software that does it. Their whole company is based around just that, right? So, um, you mm-hmm. know, which is cool because a lot of op- opportunities there. Um, but uh, the, the benefit for the exchanges is you're getting money in and out of exchanges instantly, right? Say, for example, you know, you're into arbitrage, right? Imagine if you could send Bitcoin from one exchange to another in one second, right? Now you could take advantage of this, or maybe now you're doing some kind of cool smart contract stuff, right? Um, like there's, mm-hmm. I don't know, there's a lot of really interesting things that can happen. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, I want to ask you, I want to ask you first about uh, a couple minutes on this uh, CBDC. So uh, central bank uh, distributed mm-hmm. currency, decentralized yeah. currency. Where where are we today with this? Um, has there been any news recently? And where do you think this is going? Like, how does this affect yeah. people and society? Uh, well, yeah, I don't like it. It scares me. Uh, I don't want the government mm-hmm. to be like, here's your stimulus check. You have to spend it the next six yeah. weeks or it expires. And you can only spend it on these five things, right? Like, I don't, don't tell me what to do with my money. <laughs> you know, that's, I don't like that at all. Yeah. Um, I, I see it as just such a tool that could be wildly abused. Um, and it is such a, a, a powerful tool that any government that, that has any authoritarian inkling would want to get their hands. Which is everyone, yeah. which is, I mean, just, just into yeah. it's just, yeah. yeah. Can't yeah. not be human so, beings. Um, I think it scares me a lot. I, you know, governments are working on it. It's slow, right? You got to imagine if this thing rolls out, it's a, it's a huge technical feat because you roll it out and that's it, right? It's just, it's just going to be there. Um, and you're playing with people's money at that point. So it can't fail. You can't have a bug. Um, so um, it's moving. It's very slow moving. Obviously, China is way ahead of everybody else on it. They just think it's like the best thing since sliced bread. Obviously, they would. Um, I'm just, I hope we don't, I mean, we'll eventually, we'll probably eventually see it in the United States, but maybe we'll be lucky. China, you think we'll see China's, uh, China's CBDC, I don't know, what, I forget what it's called, but like, we'll, the digital, you think that'll be R&B, digital yeah. one? Yeah. yeah. It's it's already live in some regions in China. Uh, they they're piloting it in certain areas, and then they're they're going to do. I don't think they've started the national rollout yet, but but it is operational in certain areas. 
Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> kind of like the social, the social credit score system. It's in some areas and then they're rolling it out to, you know, other areas. So, yeah. Yeah. It just doesn't seem like, I mean, the two major things that have to happen is the U S government would have to have the technical capability mm -hmm. and the, and the desire to do that, which bo both kind of seem like half ass, like, mm -hmm. yeah, do they really have the desire? Do they really have the technical capability? Uh, I don't know. I think the technical capability is there because we're the wealthiest country in the world, right? Yeah. You could pay people to build it, right? Um, yeah. They just cost a lot of money uh, because good luck finding people who really are motivated and think it's the right thing to do. Um, but I, I think there's a desire not, you know, not necessarily, I mean, I, I think of it from a, from a uh, strategic foreign perspective, less from a domestic perspective. Obviously there's a lot of that. people would love to control everyone's money domestically. But can you imagine uh, in a foreign perspective, right? U.S. dollars are just used all around the world, right? In so many different transactions. Um, and, you know, like when, when you know, two, two governments are, are engaging in an exchange of money in order to do some illegal deal or arms to, or something, they're probably using U.S. dollars, right? And if there was some way for the government to say, we're getting rid of the, the physical dollar and you're only going to get the digital dollar, we'll know everything, everybody who has it, right? Um, I mean, countries wouldn't do it, though. Well, countries that, that wouldn't, would be the there's problem. no way. That would be the problem. We'd be yeah. shooting ourselves in the foot because why would anybody want to hold dollars at that point? But at the same time, what's the other currency you're going to hold? The euro, they're going to do the same thing. You want the RMB? They're, do, they're doing it first, right? What other money are you going to hold? Well, Bitcoin, right? So I think... The, the central bank digital currencies are really going to be maybe the the one of the biggest things that push people into actual decentralized currencies uh, like Bitcoin, right? Mm. So, mm. Um, so we'll see. Um, I, I, yeah, yeah. Last thing I want to ask you: um, what's your what's your thoughts on the origin of Bitcoin, the Satoshi story? Do you certainly a little bit of background on this? Is uh, I similar to I think most people would agree he is uh he or she is just an anonymous person that is unidentified and who knows and that's 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 kind of the story i was riding with for years then i interviewed a guy a few months ago who was building on uh bitcoin sv and he was really deep into like lightning network and knew, knew all this stuff and he was like he's like man watch these videos and youtube and he, he he's like craig wright is this guy and he and i learned all about him watching and i was like oh this that actually seems more likely than not that this is the guy who was mm. working on the project. How do, where do you stand on this? Do you have you looked into it at all? Do you have any? Uh... I, I've looked into it a little bit, and I think I don't believe Craig Wright is the is the guy. Um, I'm pretty sure it was just an anonymous guy mm -hmm. um, who, who may be. I it's 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 I think it's likely to be a known person in the Bitcoin community who just went under a pseudonym at the time, but who was like one of the regulars who's speaking at conferences, but just like won't say who he is. I, I that wouldn't surprise me at all. I think there's a black swan like uh, 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 event, which is like, it was like the Chinese government creating <laughs> Bitcoin as a virus. And then like, it would become the, the global standard. Like, you know, the one thing that, that I think about is Satoshi has all this Bitcoin. Um, you know, Bitcoin becomes the global standard, which all central banks use as their as their asset of choice. And then Satoshi moves one tiny bit of Bitcoin from one of his wallets and the global economy crashes. Right. Because now all of a sudden you assume that, you know, what is it? One seventh of all the Bitcoin was just like locked up, never to be. Oh, moved, and all yeah. of a sudden you, you just increased the the total amount of value in circulation by one sixth. Yeah. Uh, in, in like a second, right? And you don't know where that money is going to flow. Um, so that's that's kind of like my crazy conspiracy theory. I don't think that's the case, mm. but it's fun. To yeah, 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 about. yeah. Yeah, I think I think a lot of the resistance to, well, he's kind of an interesting story because he, he was anonymous and he like kind of came out gradually over time. And so you're like, well, the person who did do it, they probably come out like all at once and here's, here's why I am and let me prove it with like a hard transfer. Um, and, mm -hmm. but I think there's such a, such a deep part of us that wants this to be anonymous. Like it's, it's way more magical if it's like, fucking, it's, it's a better story, it the, right? It is, it is, it is the mythos. Yeah. It is the amazing story because if there's going to be 
a money called Bitcoin that we live on in perpetuity into the future. And this is like the, 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 the genesis of the next best thing. Like, wow, what an amazing mythology behind it. Yeah. Right. This is, this uh, is where I'm like, I'm sort of like on the camp of, I think it's way more, I think if I had to put a percentage, I'd say like 80% chance that it's him. I mean, I was just watching this videos and they're showing a bunch of different stuff. And I was like, Oh, that's compelling. That's compelling. That's compelling. And then you look at who, what, what the doubt doubt is. So add up all the evidence. That's kind of where I stand on it. It's also, I'm also like, if this goes down in the record books, it like 200 years from now, thousand years from now, it's like a it, mysterious person. I'm okay with that too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's probably going to go down as a mysterious person, or maybe we'll find out when they die. It's not, you know, a letter on their deathbed or something. And the thing with Craig Wright is like, you know, he, he just needs to sign a transaction. You know, he just has to do one thing to prove cryptographically as a cryptographer should not be difficult, right? To prove cryptographically that you are the person that you claim you are. And that's all he would have to do. And everybody would believe it, but he's never been able to do it. So that, that would be my only, and again, I haven't followed it very closely, mm. but that's my understanding of the situation mm. uh, with, uh, with Craig Wright. Yeah. So it's good, good Bitcoin drama. Um, all right. Where are yeah. you on the internet? Are you writing actively or tweeting? Do you want to throw out any personal handles? We'll have all the stuff for yeah, Moon too. You know, Frank, I need to tweet more. I feel bad. I'm like gu guilty. I, I don't use Twitter that much. Um, it, it was just weird for the industry, but you can find me on Twitter at uh, uh, K R U C R A F T at Gmail. Uh, sorry, that just that's my email address. Mm -hmm. <laughs> K R U C R A F T is my is my Twitter. But better just follow follow the company. Pay with Moon on Twitter. Paywithmoon.com is our website. We're everywhere. It's just Pay with Moon. Um, Wait. That's it. Yeah, check us out. Awesome, man. Download the extension, right? Chrome extension. Mm -hmm. The extension, you can use it on our website, and uh, who knows what would happen in the future, probably. Sweet. Ken, this is fun, man. Thanks for the time. I really enjoyed it. Thanks so much for having me. Appreciate it. Cheers.